Jay and I manage the Supreme Court Observer. SC Observer aims to build a non-partisan open access database of the, of the Supreme Court of India and its contribution to our daily lives. We do this through our daily reporting and analysis of selected cases. We'd like to just briefly introduce the Center for Law and Policy Research before we proceed. CLPR is dedicated to making the Constitution work for everyone through law and policy research, social and governance interventions, and strategic impact litigation. Our focus areas include discrimination and intersectionality, transgender rights, gender and sexuality, disability rights, governance reform, and constitutional culture. In part one, we spoke to Professor Ketan about the Supreme Court's specially petitioned docket. Today, we're in conversation about a range of topics, including freedom of religion, COVID-19, and the relationship between academia and the court. Over to you, Jay. Thanks, Kritika. In your recent paper with Jane Norton on religious rights, you distinguish freedom of religion from the right against religious discrimination. If we may quote you, one right is interested in protecting certain beliefs and practices, the other in protecting our tribe. The distinction is well captured in the old joke about a Belfast rabbi being asked if he was a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew, or as Ashish Nandi claimed in the Indian context, Hindutva will be the end of Hinduism. In these examples, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hindutva, identify social political group identities, whereas Judaism and Hinduism concern religious adherence. First, could you explain the distinction between the two rights for our listeners? And then perhaps we can get into these two rights in a contemporary case. We'd like to maybe talk about them in the context of the ongoing Shabrimala review petitions. Uh, the paper just tried to distinguish between two different types of ways in which religion is meaningful to, uh, to human beings. Um, and one is the first is the obvious way in which um, we think of religion as meaningful, uh, which is in terms of our adherence to a set of principles, norms, beliefs, practices, a worldview, um, an ethical code, uh, perhaps a community. And that is, that is religion from the internal point of view of, of the adherent, right? So I, you can only appreciate the value of Hinduism as an adherent if you are a Hindu, or if you adopt that Hindu point of view, likewise of Islam from the Muslim point of view. It's difficult to appreciate these, uh, these worldviews in their fullness, right? You can, you can obviously appreciate and should appreciate that they're valuable for their members. Uh, of the adherent. And that is sort of, and, and by the way, I don't mean to exclude atheists and agnostics from, uh, from this understanding of value of religion because uh, for them not having this, um, uh, system of adherence itself is meaningful uh, and, and valuable, right? Um, and the intensity varies, but it, but it varies, uh, it is variable for all religious groups and all religious adherence, right? So you could be uh, a very thoughtful Christian who has considered your faith uh, come to, from your point of view, a reasonable, rational, conclusion that this is what you ought to do. Um, or you could be a very light touch, uh, happy-go-lucky Buddhist uh, who has never really thought about the faith. This was my parents' faith. I grew up. You, you go through the rituals perhaps in the performative dimensions without thinking about it. Same for atheism, agnostic. So within each worldview, you can be intense or relaxed. You can be thoughtful or or maybe something you've never given thought at all to, right? So that's one type of, one category of uh, religious interests that all of us have in, in adhering to or not adhering to any religion, right? Uh, and that's, that's well known, that's well understood. The second uh, idea that we try to distinguish it from in the, in the paper 
is to think of religion as a tribe, right? Think of religion in the same way that we think of our race uh, or our gender or um, our caste or disability status where, you know, so all of us have multiple identities, right? So you, I'm sure, have a zodiac sign uh, and a blood group and there may be, uh, you know, a certain, so J has three letters in your name, it starts with a J. These are all characteristics that J has. Um, and most of them don't make any difference to the success of your life or, uh, or otherwise, right? Most of them, your, what your blood group is, uh, ordinarily makes no difference to whether you live, live a successful life uh, or not, or how many obstacles you would face across uh, along the way. Uh, some other characteristics we, we carry, unfortunately don't work in this way, right? So unlike blood groups or zodiac signs, uh, characteristics like gender, sexual orientation, caste, disability, race, and a whole host of others obviously make a huge difference to how your life goes, right? Uh, they create obstacles in the path. And uh, religion, sadly, uh, in our societies is a lot less like blood group and a lot more like caste. And this is the other dimension of religion, right? Religion is your social group membership, which, which it's like a burden, right? It startles you or, or a privilege, right? If you belong to the dominant religious group, then it opens doors for you uh, that maybe you don't deserve, maybe you don't merit, right? So, um, so these are the two distinct senses in which we wanted to distinguish between uh, religious interests. Professor Ketan, could you perhaps uh, expand on these two rights in, in the context uh, of Article 25 of, of the Indian Constitution? Um, it seems to us that, that the, the first right, the freedom of religion right, definitely finds its place in Article 25. Um, what we were curious to know is whether the, the, the second right, um, the right against religious discrimination, whether you believe that it also somehow finds a place within Article 25, or whether it's located in a different part in, in, in the fundamental rights part. The argument we make is that uh, we should think of these two interests distinctively in rights terms. So uh, translated in the Indian context, um, the former interest, which is our interest in being free to adhere to or not adhere to any religion, any faith, uh, any religious practice whatsoever, uh, is properly the domain of Article 25, which is religious freedom, right? Um, and that is irrespective of whether your religion is the dominant religion or the vulnerable religious group, etc. cetera, right? <clears throat> um, on the other hand, the second interest, which is more akin to caste and race and gender, uh, we argue in the paper is, uh, is what is, properly understood to be in the domain of anti-discrimination law. So Article 15 uh, in this case. So, so in the Indian constitutional context, that is how I would distinguish the two interests. The first, the Article 25 interest that is protected um, in the context of religion. And the second would be the Article 15 non-discrimination right on the ground of religion. Do you find that that arguing councils and or academics sometimes conflate the two rights? Indeed. Uh, so if I can give you an example of a case called uh, Ueda from the UK, this is a case about a, uh, an employee of a private airline, uh, British Airways. So British Airways has a policy which forbids employees um, from wearing a, a visible cross, right? Uh, amongst other things that are forbidden as well. Now this employee uh, wants to manifest her Christian belief by wearing a visible cross at the workplace. Now for complicated uh, doctrinal reasons, so you know, uh, as a good lawyer, you will throw whatever argument is likely to work, right? Uh, un unlike a theorist who has um, 
A, no investment in the outcome of the case, and B, has all the time to figure out the right way of doing things. As a lawyer, your interest is in winning, right? You're a practical problem solver. So of course, the lawyers did what was best for the client. Uh, but what that meant was that this case got litigated in domestic British courts uh, as a discrimination case, um, a discrimination case against uh, the employer. And uh, unlike in India, where private discrimination um, is usually uh, not prohibited, you know, so housing societies can have rules like no Muslims, uh, in most uh, democracies, discrimination in the private sphere, at least the private market sphere, is prohibited. So she took um, British Airways to court claiming religious discrimination, which is akin to Article 15 violation, but against a private company, um, and failed, right? She failed because uh, of complicated doctrinal reasons and discrimination law, but not on jurisdiction, right? So the case was legitimately filed, um, but she could not show that this, there was a disparate impact on on Christians generally, right? Because the policy was facially neutral. It did not specifically target crosses. It targeted um, certain types of jewelry um, generally. So, <clears throat> so while she failed in domestic law under discrimination law, when the case was uh, appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, um, there it made more sense to, uh, to appeal uh, at least primarily under the religious freedom clause under the convention, uh, which is akin to our article 25. Um, now, <laughs> she won uh, in the European Court of Human Rights and that victory was slightly surprising. It was surprising because uh, British Airways is not the state and as a human rights charter, it's primarily uh, available against the states. In some contexts, extended for horizontal protection, but the court gives no reason whatsoever to explain why it is extending freedom of religion uh, against private part, uh, parties. So uh, one of the points we argue in the paper is that one of the key distinctions between the two rights is that the anti-discrimination right should be available against certain types of private actors. And I've worked separately on an anti-discrimination bill for the private sector, which uh, Sashita Rood MP presented in, in, in Lok Sabha in 2017. Um, and, and I hope that someday a comprehensive anti-discrimination bill will be passed in India to, to cover the private sector. But, um, but I don't think there are good reasons to extend freedom of religion guarantees, Article 25 guarantees to the private sector. I think that should be confined to the state or state-like bodies. Oh, thank you, Professor Ketan. We were, we were wondering if we could now turn back, maybe or turn forward to a contemporary um, dispute before the Supreme Court, namely the Shabrimala review petitions. Um, do you think that the court risks conflating these two distinct set of rights in, in the review petitions? And just for our listeners, maybe I'll quickly summarize how the court has gotten to the com contemporary dispute. So uh, there was a case before the Supreme Court, uh, which it delivered a judgment in in 2018, pertaining to women's access to the Shabrimala, Shabrimala Temple in, in Kerala, uh, dedicated to Lord Ayappa. So in this original case, uh, the, the court held that the custom of excluding women between the ages of 10 and 50 years old was unconstitutional. Why? Because it violated women's fun or female worshippers' fundamental right to freedom of religion. Um, there were mass protests in response, and uh, the court entertained a series of review petitions. And then in November 2019, rather than offering a, a review a traditional review judgment, it referred the case to a larger nine judge bench on certain overarching freedom of religion questions. And in doing so, it actually tagged a series of other cases to the Shabrimala review petitions. Uh, for example, one pertaining to Muslim women's right to access mosques, one about Parsi women's rights to access fire temples after having married a, a non-Parsi. 
So in tagging these petitions to the Shabrimala review petitions, has, has the court invited certain issues which are more about the uh, religious right against, against discrimination? And it, if yes, in doing so, does it risk conflating the two rights? So um, the first distinction I should draw is that the internal challenge in most of these petitions um, sees a conflict between Article 25 and Article 15, but not precisely in the same terms that my paper with Jane Norton tracks, right? Because in these cases, the so in the paper, we, we compared freedom of religion and the right against religious discrimination, right? Um, in these cases, the clashes between freedom of religion on the one hand and the right against gender-based discrimination on the other, right? So that is a key distinction. I, I hear the subtext of your question, which is that in thinking about Article 25, should the court have a uniform, one-size-fits-all approach to all religions, or are there reasons to treat minority religions differently from majoritarian ones while thinking about the scope and the weight to be given to religious freedom? If I understand that subtext clearly and, and I've brought it out clearly, then here are my thoughts. So um, India is a somewhat special case in its treatment of religious freedom in the constitution because the constitution itself carves out a clear exception uh, to the autonomy that it is granting to different religious groups. And that exception is carved out in relation to the majority religion, which is Hinduism. And it's carved out for a very specific purpose. Right? So we, we know that um, the, uh, the freedom discourse and the constitutional framing process um, saw one of the roles of the new state to be to undo, to sort of um, remove the scourge of the caste system from Hinduism. Right? So the stake took upon itself the role to uh, reform Hinduism. And given that agenda, various legal tools were put in place, Article 17, which abolished untouchability, uh, Article 25, which clearly carves out the exception for opening up temples to all classes of Hindus. Um, now, that is the context. I should, I should say that normatively, I have my doubts about the extent to which the state should get into the business of reforming religion. Uh, it's extremely dangerous territory. Now, of course, um, the scourges of the caste system, or at least many of the scourges of the caste system, uh, had to be dealt with. So the, the choices that I have in mind are not the choice between doing something about caste and not doing something about caste. The choice is whether the state should have dealt with caste purely as a secular matter, itself indifferent to religion, or to intervene in the religious space to, to, um, to reform it from within. Uh, and my hesitation in thinking about state reform of religion is that A, it makes the religion itself defensive. It, um, it incentivizes uh, reactionary voices within religion. It somehow kills, kills is perhaps too strong. It, um, 
it reduces the ability of, of the religion to reform from itself. I don't think it's a surprise that Hinduism saw um, so many reform movements leading until independence. And then once the state takes over the task, there is less incentive for, for the group itself to, to do something about it. But anyway, that's, that's beside the point. From a constitutional framework, in India, Hinduism is special. So we are a secular state, but the constitution treats Hinduism different from other religions. Uh, and often this manifests in state favors as well. So the, re the entire reason why Shabrimala became a case where jurisdiction was not really a problem was because the state had formulated those rules prohibiting women of certain ages from entering as state rules, right? So state action becomes implicated. But, you know, it seems bizarre. Why should the state be legislating on temple entry rules? It's not the business of the state, ordinarily speaking, right? So, so the Indian state is just so enmeshed in the management of Hinduism internally, managing trusts, upkeep of temples, um, and that it's, it's really quite difficult to fully disentangle Hinduism from the Indian state. And that is one reason why, and this is by design, this is not by accident, right? Uh, the Indian constitution, despite not establishing Hinduism as the state religion, does all these things, which make it come close to not necessarily for preferential reasons, but for reform reasons, but come close to being treated as if it was an established uh, religion. So think of the comparison with the uh, Church of England in the UK, where there are far fewer difficulties in the state regulating, legislating uh, to manage the Church of England, because that's the established church, right? And there is no separation of church and state. So that's legitimate. But when the church, when the state legislates with regard to other religions, then there's a stronger claim to freedom of religion. So I think that is the only ground based on which we could see a, an argument for a doctrinal and a normative distinction between Hinduism and other religions, that the constitutional scheme treats Hinduism differently, uh, sometimes preferentially, sometimes, well, it depends on how you think of reform. You know, if reform is good for Hinduism, then that is preference all the way. If getting rid of the caste system is bad for Hinduism, then detrimentally. But uh, so, so that would be my take. But I think that um, if, we, if we forget the state, historic state entanglement with Hinduism in India, then worship is such a key aspect of uh, a religious activity that the weight of the right to religious freedom ought to be the weightiest, the strongest, the heaviest when it comes to worship. And I think that, um, you know, uh, of all the dimensions of religious freedom, who can worship and how ought to be one part of the freedom that should be very difficult um, for the state to outweigh by other considerations. Thanks, Professor. Uh, now, as a scholar of anti-discrimination law, you've been working on this for the past several years. Um, how do you see the, court, the Supreme Court's approach towards the executive, especially during COVID-19 pandemic lockdown? You know, be it the way uh, things were uh, responded to uh, regarding the migrant labor crisis or, you know, rights of, the rights of prisoners during lockdown. How do you see generally, uh, are there any trends that you, can, that you can pick up with respect to how the court um, responded towards executive during the lockdown? Put two caveats uh, first before I give an, an answer. The first is that answering any question that that seeks um, 
the view of the Indian Supreme Court, as, as, as you guys well know, is a very difficult question to answer, right? It is, it is the quintessentially polyvocal court. It speaks in so many different voices through its multiple benches, um, at least indifferent to precedent, to what has been said before by other benches, that, um, that it's very hard to attribute any view to the court. It's not a, it's not a coherent institution that speaks in one voice. So at most we can speak about trends. Uh, we can speak about dominant trends, but you know, it's often said that uh, any claim about uh, you make about India, it's opposite is also likely to be true, right? And I think the same may well be true of the Indian Supreme Court as well. You can always find exceptions. We can only, we can only point to, um, perceptions and you know what I have is perceptions right now because I haven't studied this uh, this series of cases in any detail. Uh, the second thing I want to say about uh, the pandemic is that it has uh, you know in the early days of the pandemic when the British Prime Minister falls sick uh, and lots of well-known people are catching the flu, um, some dying from it, um, you saw commentary often on social media talking about the pandemic as a great leveler. You know, the virus does not see your caste or your race, right? Uh, sadly, it does. And as, as the months have gone by, it's become abundantly clear that all the existing um, problems um, of inequality, of discrimination in society have been exacerbated by this external pressure. As in, if you want to use a metaphor, um, I don't know, you can, you can imagine some structure with, with, with existing fault lines, right? Where if, if you put more pressure on that structure, then it's most likely to break first at the fault lines, at the existing fault lines. And that's, that seems to be how discrimination has worked out uh, with the pandemic across the US and the United Kingdom where we have more reliable statistics, uh, the virus has killed and infected people in, uh, in non-white communities, disproportionately in uh, poorer communities, disproportionately and often they are the same. Um, so in, in a whole host of other uh, inequalities have, you know, so uh, even the lockdown, so not just the pandemic, but what we have done in response to the pandemic, the impact of lockdown on migrant workers, um, on women uh, working from home, uh, shouldering uh, the already heavier bur burden of, uh, of care duties alongside employment duties, alongside possibilities of domestic violence without any uh, prospects of, uh, uh, of, of finding uh, relief or, or respite. So all of those have, have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, in terms of the court's response, as, as, a, as a casual but consistent observer of the court, it seems to have been um, grossly inadequate from an initial phase where the court had a hands-off approach to, um, to the pandemic, which was doing nothing. Uh, it evolved gradually and under substantial civil society pressure to a more interventionist court, but interventionist again, and there's a great paper I read this morning from Anuj Bhavania on how the court, um, how when you look at the petitions, the orders in these pandemic cases, and this is a symptom, this is not new, this is not something that's just happening now. There's no law in any of these orders or any of these petitions, right? The court is just sitting as a panchayat of wise men, sadly it's mostly men, um, which just does things that sort of seem right thing to do. Uh, there is no uh, pretense even to look at uh, arguments of jurisdiction, arguments of judicial power, arguments on, of breach of rights, of identifying a systematic process of you know what right is engaged how has it been breached um, and and that is really sad because the court is really acting as if it was the executive um, 
but not taking the executive to account. So another finding of Bhavania's uh, in this paper is that the court has translated in its orders these cases from, a, from cases about the failure of the executive to do what was necessary into cases about a humanitarian disaster where we need to do something for the poor, right? So instead of locating state failure by showing how rights have been breached, uh, they become cases of state largesse that, you know, uh, there's been an earthquake, do something about it, right? So th there's that problem, but there's also a problem of judicial discipline, right? When courts start becoming indifferent to law, uh, we are in very dangerous territory, right? For all the problems that scholars have cited about legality as a cloak, I think that that's been a huge disservice, by the way, you know, critical scholars talking about legality as a cloak for power uh, has actually ended up convincing the courts that um, if law is power, we don't need the law anywhere. We can access and exercise power directly. Even, even as a cloak, uh, it performs some disciplining role for the courts, and that's gone, right? Uh, and, and that is hugely problematic. You know, this, there are no processes. Uh, judicial process does not matter. Anybody can go to court. Um, and, you know, the progressives cheered the court when it did all of this. And I think it's, it's come back to bite us. We have a, 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 an extremely powerful, completely unaccountable and, um, and, and, and unpredictable institution, uh, which, uh, which is not something a democracy should tolerate. Thanks for answering those questions, Professor. We have one last question for you, uh, a rather generic one. Uh, when we look at the Supreme Courts in uh, America and also in UK, what we see is that both these courts place uh, a heavy reliance on what academics have to offer in terms of doctrinal theory, in terms of you know newer arguments. We see a we see a heavy and deep engagement with uh, with academics uh, and what what they what they write uh, by both these Supreme Courts. But when we look at India, what we see is this is not a norm. Of course, the Supreme Court relies uh, on uh, papers and, and, and in fact, it has also relied on one of your papers in, in, in uh, writing its judgment. But we don't see this happening on a consistent uh, basis. So uh, the question to you is, how do you, how do you see the relationship between um, uh, the courts and academics, and, and what do you have to say, especially with respect to uh, the Indian setup? Sure. So, um, as an academic, I think it's hugely important to maintain a healthy distance uh, from practice. Uh, it's one of the uh, pathologies of the American law school model and the American law review model is that everyone wants to be cited and everyone wants to have an impact and and change policy and one of the dangers of that fixation is that you have a decade of scholars churning out articles uh, speaking to one person anthony kennedy the swing judge on the supreme court right so so it creates perverse incentives for academics, where in, if as a scholar, your, your sole and only virtue is truth seeking and truth telling, right? So when, when other factors like, can I influence the court on this question start affecting your scholarship, that's bad news uh, for a scholar. And I see, uh, the academy as part of a system of checks and balances in a democracy where uh, we perform a, a truth-telling role with the media uh, to, to, to demand discursive accountability from power and state power in particular. We seek different types of truths. The media seeks uh, immediate truths that are discoverable readily. The academy seeks deeper truths that are not 
apparent on the surface, right? So that's from the academic point of view. But but we and the legal academy, which speaks the language of power, has a particular duty to hold the uh, legal account uh, to, to hold discursively uh, accountable institutions like courts, right? So it's our job to to criticize them, to check if they're doing their jobs. From the court's point of view, I think practice is, um, so by the way, I should also put in the caveat that I don't think the, the academy should ignore practice, right? The academy must study practice and see what practice is doing. All I'm saying is it should not have an eye necessarily on influencing practice all the time. On the other hand, practice must engage with the academy by reading what academics are writing, but knowing that they are doing a different job from us, right? Judges are pragmatic problem solvers. They don't have the luxury of deep time that I have as a scholar. I can, for, I, you know, I can spend a year writing an article. They have, what, four days to decide a case, right? Uh, and that is, that is a luxury for the Indian Supreme Court as well, right? So, so they are practical problem solvers. They are not theorists and they should not see their task as, as devising theory. Now, of course, you know, norms of plagiarism must apply. So if they are borrowing ideas from academics, they must cite it. I think ideas should reach the court, not so much through court clerks, which is what currently happens, but through litigants. Right? It's the bar, not the bench, that is the problem here. The bar needs to engage with academic research far more deeply in a far more engaged fashion and just develop the practice of citing academic work alongside their arguments, put them before the court. And then that should then feed into the judgments. And that is a practice, that is a culture that we don't currently have. And we need to have much more uh, rigorous engagement of the bar with, with scholarship. Thank you, Professor uh, Ketan. We've had a great, Great time talking to you. It's been really insightful listening to your nuanced takes on these various issues, both on the administrative and judicial side. And uh, we look forward to, to speaking to you again in the future.